Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the National Hot Rod Past, Present and Future podcast. I'm joined, as always, by National Hot Rod Racing's Mr. Motivator, Gary Staines. <laughs> and <a> <laughs> uh, also with us today, the founder of this podcast, in fact, and the webmaster of nationalhotrod.com. But of course, uh, known best of all as uh, National Hot Rod number 42, it's Shane Bland. Hi, Shane. How are you doing? Yeah, feeling good. I am uh, I'm feeling really optimistic actually this week i feel like uh you know the sun's come out and the end is near and we won't be able to go racing soon yeah well i bet we i bet you can't wait um and it's been great that uh we've been able to kind of keep the conversation going over these quiet months and uh you've uh, entrusted gary and myself with looking after this uh so you've just come back to check up on us and make sure we're doing it right tonight have you well i think you've done a great job and uh and the drivers and people that you've interviewed so far have been fantastic. All very different, and that's what's great about it. It's uh, you know we're we're all different people, and I think people. What's clear is that you know just by the positive feedback that uh, you guys are getting is that you know it doesn't matter whether it's uh, you know chatty man on the other end or you know or or, or acquired a person or whatever. It's just really interesting for me as well. You know, I'm a fan of the sport. Uh, I don't know much about the other drivers, not, not all of them, some of them better than others. And, uh, and also looking back at the history. So, yeah, I love it. Brilliant. Brilliant. It's a, a great chance to really build characters in the sport. And uh, we, I think going back as a childhood, you know, you, you get, you love the cars, you know, like that's something that kids will sort of, doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl, you get excited by racing, you love the cars. And then when you realise there's people inside the cars and there's characters and, you know, we go on about the great, the so-called great days of racing, um, we've got the opportunity of doing that all over again by the, by the internet. You know, didn't you imagine how, how sort of, uh, how big Barry Lee or George Polly, Duffy Collard or Chris, how big they could have been with the internet, you know? And, uh, and you guys that are driving are really good characters. And I think that's what I like about this is getting to know people more, you know, the people we've interviewed so far, it's, you know, we're all learning fascinating stories. So yeah. I'm, I'm hoping this develops that way. Yeah. yeah. No, we really are. And it's been really good to get to know everybody. And uh, our plan today is that we're actually going to ask you a few questions about yourself, your racing career, how you've got to where you've got to. And uh, then, Shane, uh, you've, you've uh, kindly agreed to let us see the new steed. And obviously, this is something that's uh, very much... Uh, on our minds at the moment is uh, you're debuting the new car and we're going to ask you to show us that car see where we've got to on it and tell us a little bit about it uh, but before that it would be really good to uh, just chat a little bit about to about how you've got to where you are now of course you have a very famous father the 1979 uh, national hot rod world champion gordon bland and uh, i guess he must have won that world title you must have been uh, it's about the time you were probably born, I should think. Yeah, uh, I was born in April, um, so I'd have been a few months old. I think I wasn't there. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those things whereby I can't remember the first time I, you know, wanted to race a car, but I can't remember a time when I didn't want to, and I can't remember a time when you know, uh, it wasn't about hot rod racing, even though by the time I was sort of five or six, my dad had stopped racing anyway, but mm. it was firmly in there. You know, it was, it was as though I was there anyway, even though I had never seen a hot rod race at the time when I was about six, I'd never seen a hot rod race. So yeah, it's a strange one, but it's absolutely been on my mind since day one. <laughs> so was it inevitable that you were going to head into a, a national hot rod racing? do you think from from the year dot um it's certainly what i wanted to do and i've always you know continued to want to do it and my main driver really is because i want to win the the world championship that's what i've wanted to do since day one and mm. and you know that that's kind of been a driver for as long as i can remember i've always wanted to do that and i haven't done it as yet but even when i went off racing other things the plan was always, or the ambition was always to come back and do this at some point, regardless of what happened, because 
this really does genuinely mean more to me than any other type of racing that I look at. You know, I'm not, I love touring cars. I enjoy Formula One to a degree. Um, but, you know, they don't, to, to, for me thinking, oh, it'd be nice to win the British Touring Car Championship. It doesn't really, it doesn't give me a buzz like the thought of winning the National Hot Rods. You know, that gives me, uh, oh, you know, when I think about it, it's, and that's probably why I've never won it. Because <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> too much, too much. We, we did speak about that before, but do, do you remember that, that moment when you realised your dad had been a world champion and, and in that sort of scene of the Midland hot rod scene where there was so many great drivers, I think your dad was the first uh, driver mm. to come that won from that area, but you know, other drivers, uh, Tom Laffey, Mensley, Pete Stevens, Stu Jackson, do you remember them as well in your childhood or was it just about your dad? Um, I remember them. I remember all the faces because they used to come around, you know, we used to have some parties, barbecues, that kind of stuff. Like not very often, but every few years and, you know, they'd, they'd come through the door and, and, you know, it'd be a big sort of uh, party. Uh, and But it was always, it always felt like, my dad was like the Formula One world champion or something. It was never, it was never kind of understated. It was everywhere we went, you know, and saw friends and all that sort of stuff. It was a big thing. Um, almost sort of embarrassingly, really, now looking back, because it is an amazing thing. And that, but at the time, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was, in, it was kind of just one of those things I grew up with. And before I really knew what National Hall were I you know to me it was like he was like you know an absolute legend I mean he still is but in a different way I think there's a lot of people who would agree with you on that one um wh one question why did you choose the number 42 and not the number 356 as quite often you see sons and daughters of racers using their parents number what uh, what deterred you from using 356 um, um I thought I, I, I thought I, I it's a bit echoing a bit now, but echoing a bit now, but I've um I've always been kind of individual. Um always wanted to do my own thing, even though I wanted to do hot rods or follow my dad's footsteps. Uh and also he <laughs> is his number, you know, it's his number. And for me that's you know, I've got a picture of him on the wall here. And I didn't want to um, sort of uh, devalue that number to a degree. Uh, so, and we've always had a pic. We always had a pic. We always had a, um, a painting of Aubrey Layton, who's a stock car driver. Yeah. Uh, and his number was forty-two, and it's yeah. always been on the wall in the house. So, I, I, I've always grown up looking at that number, and I thought, yeah, that'll do. That was Aubrey Layton who inspired the number forty-two. Now, I see that's something I've learned today. Brilliant. So your um, roots. Um, oh, go on, Gary. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I think we're probably going to ask the same question. Where, where, where was the route into into hot rod racing, and how old was you when you first started? Um. Oh, the route was painfully slow, in my opinion. But uh, many people will say the opposite because I <laughs> was, I was luckily lucky enough to race hot rods when I was sixteen, which you're allowed to. Uh, so I was, it was sort of, I think it was probably August. I'm, I was 16 in the April. It's probably August or something like that. And dad was, dad had the, the Sonny Howard 205 that he'd been racing for a few years. And, you know, I was sort of uh, <laughs> strongly um, indicating that now would be a great time for me <laughs> to get in and drive it. I uh, remember it. I remember it well. <laughs> yeah previous, previous to that I, you know I wanted to I always wanted to race I wanted to do karting I wanted to do this I wanted to do that and dad you know basically wouldn't let me you know there's no two ways about it and because he was racing and he was doing his thing and and now I really appreciate that because actually I've got a five-year-old son and I'm thinking well I'm not done yet so uh you'll have yeah. to wait to so a degree. Did, did you uh, go straight into National Hot Rods? You didn't go into any other classes? You, you sat straight into a National Hot Rod as your first proper racing car? 
Yeah, yeah, straight in into wow. the National Hot Rod. I'd never raced anything other than, you know, well, I haven't raced anything. I'd basically done the indoor go karting and stuff. Um, that must have been terrifying. That... <laughs> <laughs> the crazy thing at that age, you couldn't drive on the road, but you went straight to see you drive a hot rod before you drove a road car. Yeah, yeah, it was, oh, it was, I've never really thought about it until now, but yeah, I suppose it was strange. Um, I, I was just obsessed with doing well, though, and I suppose I still am, but I was obsessed with, you know, uh, proving myself and being quick. And and so I think that overtook all the fear and everything else. I just wanted to be good. And, you know, luckily, things turned out quite well quite early and and it and it gave me the confidence to, you know, that I could I could do it. Mm. do you so, remember how you got on on the first race did you did you win it from the front or, or how was the first race do you remember it yeah i i remember it and i also and I, I remember it so well and i remember um you know what what i was doing wrong and all that sort of stuff and actually i started at the front and terry grant won i think all three races or certainly the two heats and I think I finished second and third, something like that. I can't remember wow. I finished, but that's good. Which but track yeah. was that? Which track? That was at Northampton, right. um, and it was yeah, it was it was oh, it was fantastic. It was uh, you know, I can't words can't explain how how good it was. It was brilliant. I can't get my head round. A, a, a national hot rod being the first thing that you drove when you see it as most people it's the pinnacle it's what they move up to and aspire to and to do well in it from the word go showed that you must have had it it must have been in the genes um we talked a few weeks ago about that 96 world final um the one that christy won uh was that your first world final the 96 one yeah, so that was, I think, the first year of the groups that we used to have, whereby uh, there was, you know, a qualified, you had to finish in the top four, for example, to be able to, to get pole position unless you, uh, so that's the top four in the English Championship, to be in yeah. a chance of getting pole in the World well, Final. Very complicated and glad it's all over now. <laughs> but basically what it meant is I did 10 rounds, I did about 10 rounds that year of the qualifying rounds. And so... I was kind of fairly low down in the qualifying um, and I'd had a good sort of start, but it hadn't kind of, you know, it hadn't perfectly clicked, but I was doing okay. And then we were on the press day that we used to have for the world final and um, Sonny came over and helped me a little bit with the car um, because the car was always set up, one for my dad, but he was... He, he admits that he couldn't set up a space frame chassis particularly well, like he could a Mark II Escort, for example. <laughs> um, anyway, Sonny came and just sort of grunted at a few things and said, do this, do that. And I did that and suddenly found my form. And yeah, on the qualifying day, I was third quickest, actually. Um wow. And it was only really, I think I was equal second or something like that. And uh, it was only Orman that outdid me. Uh, but it meant I had to start, because of the way the qualifying was, or the rounds or whatever, I had to start 19th. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I still was pleased with the, the speed I found. And you, you came home in sixth place. Is that still your best result to date in the world? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's my best world final. <laughs> the first. By a long shot. There was... There was no yellow flags, bone dry day, and came from 19th to 6th. Wow. And I was pushing Colin Smith over the line. And, oh, man, it's so, like now, even more so, you think, oh, if things had just been slightly different, yeah. you know, if, if Orman wasn't there, I might have got pole. And then I was certainly quick enough to 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 lead the race or if I was mm. starting behind Orman to finish second. Orman was obviously in a different league that year. Mm. Um but oh yeah, I just I mean I just I was just having fun. It was just the most enjoyable time of my life. It was just incredible. 
It's crazy that um, back then there was no yellow flags. I mean, I know we had sort of slightly different rules and the track was narrow as well, if I, if I remember rightly back then. And uh, I can't remember last World Final where we haven't had a lot of stoppages, really. I, I don't yeah. know whether maybe the stakes are higher or do you think there's any reason why we get more stoppages these days? Or I blame um, the stewarding. <laughs> yeah, definitely the, the stewarding. has been a bit poor. It's, it's improved <laughs> in the last couple of years. Um, <laughs> I'm off um, now. See you all next week. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's yeah. There's I think there's more drivers on the pace. Uh, so you know you look down. Certainly since I've been back doing it since 2013 and probably before then. But you look down the grid and there's at least ten drivers that are worthy world champions. You know that at least 10 you know you look at top and at, there's 10 that are could he that you could say yeah he's a worthy world champion he could yeah. definitely do it yeah and there's at least another five that you go look on their day mm. they could win it so i think the margins is just so so small um the cars are a bit bigger now than they used to be um those 205s were just like such a perfect size yeah. uh, to, to actually race with. So there is that, you know, and I think, yeah, people are, um, are more all or nothing, you know, these days. Out of curiosity, and we'll, we'll look at your new car shortly, but how much wider is a new car to, than the 205? Uh, don't know. Pass. <laughs> it's the it expert. Wider. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you had a stint in National Hot Rods, but uh, the big time was calling and uh, you had your eyes on circuit racing. Yeah, well, actually, um, at that world final, 96, um, Kevin Clark was a spectator and he was, he'd got a Eurocar team, which at the time Eurocar was getting massive. Yeah. Um, really, really big crowds and oh, just brilliant and anyway he just he came up after the last chance race or something and just said oh do you want to come and have a go in a euro car <laughs> i was like yeah right you know <laughs> but I, I think i looked to my dad and was like oh, can i uh he like yeah i mean yeah so i just went and had a test day at mallory and that and then the week then he said oh do you want to come and have another go next week i was like yeah okay and uh and then the next week he he turned up and it was a brand new car with my name on the side and it was like oh uh so he's like well yeah you, you know you're gonna race it next year I was like, well uh yeah you know and he had a really good sponsor and everything amazing. and you know it was just it was just too good to, to to say no to it was amazing and i you know i had oh, it, was, it was fantastic so how did you then end up in gt racing um so I did a couple of years on the Eurocar. Uh, first year, I got rookie of the year. Second year, I was fighting for the championship with Peter Folding and Mark Proctor, um, Paul Sheard. It was, it was monumental. It was brilliant. Um, but I finished third. Peter Folding won it. Um, that was, you know, fantastic driving, racing people like that. Um, and then I decided that if if I, I just sort of made my mind up by then that I wanted to try and make a career out of racing cars and I thought I'd have a go. And so I sort of tried to, you know, speak to other teams in other championships, which may give me an opportunity to race GT cars and mm. race at Le Mans, which was my sort of my ambition. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I sort of had 99, I had a year out, 2000, I did the Marcos challenge, which is like the TVR Tuscan challenge, but not as good, basically, uh, they were trying to be as good and cars were great, but I won that championship. And then the team I was racing with that year had a GT team as well. And, and, you know, one thing led to another and managed to 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 get into that and mm. raced in the British GTs in two thousand one. 
I, can I just ask, sorry, Gary, I, um, just quickly, though, um, I, I was looking at it and your teammates, your co-driver in that, was that uh, Shane Lynch of Boyzone by any chance? Yeah, one of many. Uh, that was, uh, it <laughs> what was, a claim to fame. <laughs> yeah. He, he, yeah, well, basically, we were, you know, a really small team, really tight on funding. Team boss was funding it pretty much. Um, and they had, they had sort of two or three cars for different in different levels of racing. And yeah, it was just the car wasn't competitive. Uh, it was the it was a year where Porsche GB had two works cars. Mm. Um, it was super competitive. The year before, the car would have been fine. You know, the, we would have been competitive. Um, and that's what motivated us to do it because actually the year before the Marcos Mantis, I did a couple of GT rounds and it just sort of because I could and we were really competitive even though the car wasn't a GT3 car Wow! and then the year after Porsche and everyone just went faster and faster and we were left quite a long way behind so mm. it just meant that we didn't have proper funding and we were looking around for different drivers to to race with us. So I had some great teammates. I had a guy called Darren Malkin, mm -hmm. who um, who was very very quick in Formula Ford at the time. Yeah. He, he was leading the Formula Ford Festival when Mark Webber won, um, but he led it until he spun in the rain. <laughs> uh, I had Jackie Van Der Ender, who There's was a also a Formula Ford uh, yeah. Festival winner. And they were, they was great because I could race against, they were my teammates in the same car and I could compare myself and I did really well, you know, uh, generally I could, was as quick or quicker, so that's good. And then Shane was part of the team for a long time um, and he was just driving really, really well. And it was kind of became a, well, let's, let's try, let's put Shane in the car and see how he gets on. And, and, you know, he's a really nice guy um really hard worker at racing really serious in terms of trying to be respectful uh and trying to make sure he performs well and we got on really well and you know we go through the data and work out i'd try and help him go a bit quicker um some tracks he was like very close other tracks a bit further away but yeah he's a great guy brilliant at the um you said at the beginning you've always wanted to be national hot rod world champion. So in this period of your racing, was was that still in the background, or or, or was that just completely gone at that point? No, it's still there, hundred percent. It was still there. Right. Um, it was. I, I, look, the thing I thought is, well, okay, while I'm young, I've got to go and try and do this, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, you can be a bit older and race uh, hot rods. Um, and you can be a bit older and race circuit cars, but it's kind of not the fashion. Um, uh, but in GT racing, having said that, in GT racing, there are a lot more older drivers because you need speed and experience and everything else that goes with it. Um, so, yeah, it was always the ambition to come back and do hot rods. But that uh, pathway, I guess, maybe was accelerated slightly by what happened at Donington in 2001. So uh, tell us a little bit about what happened on that particular day. So that day, so Shane Lynch was my teammate, uh, and it was a really hot day, and uh, we were just, you know, pushing hard. And he came, he did his stint, which was about half an hour, the first half of the race. Then I jumped in and did my to do my stint and I just started to get brake fade and that's fairly common um, to get a bit of brake fade and with circuit cars you, when you go over the curbs you get like what they call pad knockoff the vibration separates the pads away from the disc so mm -hmm. you quite often left foot braking you know down the straight before you you've got a braking zone just to make sure the pads are connected to the disc and everything's okay and if you get a bit of brake fade you, you pump it a few times and away you go and so I was doing that and sort of labouring that for a few I don't know quite a few laps I suppose and then I just went into to Redgate and it didn't matter what I did I pumped away and nothing happened and yeah uh, so I decided to try and turn into the corner anyway nearly 
nearly fired it into the back of Mike Jordan, actually, who was racing <laughs> in GT1 or two, GT2, whatever it was, but he was leading the race. Uh, if I'd hit him, I would have written that car off. But luckily <laughs> for him, and probably for me, I missed it. Or probably not for me, but no, I missed it'd be it. would better if you had it, really, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I uh, went backwards into the wall. And yeah, 101 miles an hour, I hit the wall, concrete wall, and smashed the concrete, uh, but stopped. Mm. And then it went up in flames. and It was pretty horrific. It's on YouTube if you want to go and watch it. And I shattered vertebrae in my neck. So I, I was... Uh, sent to hospital quite quickly not quite in a helicopter because it was really close to the uh, Queen's Hospital in Nottingham which is good for neck and then yeah spent uh, a little while in there had a had a uh, new neck put in I had a vertebrae removed and a metal wow. one installed and some bolts connected all together I mean, as you say, it's on uh, YouTube and it's uh, a pretty terrifying. It's pretty, it's a pretty big impact. And then you see the car uh, go up in flames as well. And that must have been pretty terrifying at the time. Did you remain conscious during the accident or were you out cold as a result of the impact? I was in and out. It was worse for my parents <clears throat> because they were standing on that bloody corner. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> they're, about, they're about 50 metres down the road watching oh. so oh mm -hmm. like they aged probably 10 years at that yeah. day it was that that's what that was the bit that uh was the painful bit to be honest yeah. when it happens to you you kind of go well i'll deal with this one way or another um and i, I, yeah, I did go in, i was in and out con i kind of remember i remember the noise of the gravel i remember them cutting the roof off rough you know little bits of it mm. and i remember the the silence and just the noise of the marshal's feet on the gravel carried me off on the stretcher. So weird stuff like that. Wow. Uh, but yeah, marshals were awesome that day. Yeah, as they always are. Uh, any uh, long lasting effects as a result of it? I mean, you said you were in a, a, a back brace and or a neck brace. Uh, I mean, you, you're obviously a little bit bionic now, but um, are you... Are you clearly set the metal detectors off at the airport but um have you would you say you've recovered or do you still think there are uh, ongoing issues as a result of that accident um i've recovered um uh and and i would never have gone back racing again if it wasn't for the hands device which if i'd had it on at the time i would have been fine Wow. But it was just that it was that year when I think it was compulsory in Formula One, but no one else really had them. Mm. Um, and if I'd had the hands device, we'd have been fine. Uh, but it, it was really a case of, well, if I had another impact like that, you know, it wouldn't my it would be a different story altogether. Yeah. So that really that's why I stopped doing the circuit racing, because I thought, well, you know, it's just it basically becomes a stupid thing to do. Um so it was kind of as time, and then I went on and got on with work and just forgot about racing. Never, well, I didn't forget about it, but I never thought about it. I tried to not think about it. I didn't go to racetrack for, I don't know, 10 years or whatever. Really? Uh, and it, that was the worst bit mentally, really. I it really, you know, it, it was my, my lifelong passion and suddenly I'm not doing it anymore. And so I went off and, Got got a job if you like, and and mm. you know didn't go anywhere near racetrack. That must have been. And you returned, so so again straight back into a hot rod, was it? There was nothing in between, so. You... Yeah, uh, so it was it was kind of um, uh, many reasons, I suppose. Is one I could afford to go racing. So that's the, the first thing. Yeah, actually, I could do, I could go and race hot rods because I'm earning enough money to do it. Um, two, you know, me and my dad go to the pub uh, occasionally and we talk about hot rod racing. <laughs> we don't talk about anything else. Uh, <laughs> we don't talk about business. Never, we've never talked about business ever. Races. Uh, we've never. You know, he's a successful businessman. I am as well. Uh, and we've never discussed it, never talked about it. Not, not 
you know, it's really odd. We just talk about racing, uh, might talk about lawnmowers or something, but basically <laughs> racing. So it's got I, engine in it. <laughs> I got to the point where I kind of got fed up of talking about the same stories that were now 10 years old or out of date at least. And I just thought, you know what, this is what am I doing? This is, I can't just think back to the what ifs and, mm. and how quick I was and, you know, how I could have done this and I could have done that and all that sort of stuff. I got fed up of talking about it. So I thought, right. To go out and do it. I was just thinking that, you know, when you stopped racing after the accident, mentally, that must have been really tough to have given up on this. You know, you, you thinking you're going to be a, a full time professional racing driver and suddenly the dream is over pretty well over. Well, less than overnight, the dream is gone and you suddenly got to go out and get a different kind of career. And mentally, I, I just I can't even comprehend how you can come back from that to be quite honest because that must be very tough. Yeah, it was one of those where I um, buried it, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like they say you should never do, and <laughs> buried it, didn't deal with it, and luckily, you know, over time, I kind of taught myself to deal with it, and you know, had to speak to myself about it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was looking back there's a lot of um consequences of that mm. that led to things happening in my life which are totally unrelated but you know because of it and it's the same old story whether you whatever you've got sort of some kind of trauma of whatever or some kind of you know something and i i guess i cope with it because i thought this i mean it's racing you know what i mean it's not it's not and that's how I always dealt with it. It's just racing. And, and whilst the, that's what I kept telling myself, obviously mm. inside, it, racing's everything to me. Mm. But you've got to kind of look at other people in the world and go, well, look, they're a lot worse off. So I kind of just managed it to that point until I, um, and it was only when I started racing again, I thought, oh my God, like I really needed this. <laughs> I missed this. So um, what, yeah, I'm just aware. Sorry, we it's we've been talking for half an hour already. Oh, okay. so I can't believe that we could probably go on all night. Um, yeah. What year did you come back into the uh, National Hot Rods then? Because it was in the Speedworth rental car, if I remember rightly, wasn't it? Yeah, it was um, 2013, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it might have been 2014. I think it was the end of 2013. Thinking about it. So yeah, it was just a cat. I again hadn't been to a race meeting. I went to one. I went to the. I went to one race meeting that year, which was. Uh, it was Hensford. It was the one that. It's sort of almost the dullest race meeting of the year. It's like a really non-event. It's like round three or four or something, <laughs> and it's one of those where, for whatever reason, every year we, when we were on that particular race meeting it's really lacklustre and I went and watched it and there wasn't anyone to watch in. It was just a, it was a dull day. It was, <laughs> there was nothing nice about it apart from the race. There was really good stewing going on that day. Though, oh, yeah, don't start. Don't 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 start. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I walked around, I walked around the paddock and I recognised everyone, but they didn't recognise me because I'd been, you know, the last time they'd seen me, I was uh, uh, like a schoolboy. <laughs> you had hair. <laughs> yeah so i walked around but didn't say hello to anyone i just wandered about observed um and then and then i i don't know i must have gone i must have just rang speed i didn't even i didn't know anything like who was running speed i didn't know dean or wood or anything i didn't know any anything about anything um so i managed i think i rang speed with and they said oh we got a car and and it was richard poulter that you know basically was brilliant he just said right okay this is what and he sorted everything out brilliant. and uh i did a couple of i did uh, a couple of rounds i mean that first round i did was the i think the bonfire night um maybe oh, that's it. what a debut at that event Un under the famous hensford floodlights i think i think it must have been yeah it must it was wow. um yeah I think we it did was. that and it was like 
Oh man, I've got a really good picture somewhere of well, in very, very, very tight overalls. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got my overalls from ten years before or whatever, and they were very tight. And uh, I could, <laughs> and I've got a picture of me coming out of the car. The years like, of not being kind. <laughs> But I've got the biggest grin and my eyes are out my head. And I'm just Brilliant. like, and I remember I was like, I've got to go back. This is uh, time. Wonderful. And since that time, I would, I would say looking at the stats, probably your best year has probably been the 2018 season, would you say? When you won yeah. the European and third in the national, amongst other things. Yeah, that's that was definitely. I mean, it's been really, it's been like one hell of a slog. I've got to be honest. I came back and I thought, well, I'll jump in, get used to it, and I'll be right up there knocking on the door and, you know, going out winning. And it took it took you know a few years to get anywhere near competitive. I mean, I think it took me eighteen months or two years to get my first time start at the Reds. You know, I remember that sort of. I remember thinking, oh wow like at last and it was more <laughs> of a fluke but oh it's been really 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 hard and mm. uh, and I wasn't expecting that and it was a bit of a shock to the system and I kind of thought yeah I'll turn up a couple of years I'll win everything and then I'll be gone or that, I'll, you know I'll get a choice then is that is that harder because you have got older or is it harder because the sport has become harder than what it was when you were racing the 205 I think it's a bit of both. I think it's definitely harder because there's more, a bit like what I said earlier, there's, there's a lot more car, competitive cars. You know, there's, you know, so many people that can win races, so many fast drivers. No one gives an inch. There's not people that will just get out of your way. Or, mm. and all, but, I mean, it was pace. I was just struggling for pace. I just didn't have the pace was the main thing. And then, you know, end up crashing a lot because I'll get in everyone's way. And yeah, it's been, it's been, I've had some real lows, I must say, because my expectation was that I'd be a lot better than I was. Um, but that, I'm pleased about that, really, because yes, whilst I would have liked to win everything, um, you know, if I'd just turned up and won everything, you know, it would have been, um, you know, I, the satisfaction wouldn't be there for when I do do it. And I've had some, epic races which yeah. we can talk about another time but I've had a, some amazing races and the ones that are ones that I should have won and I didn't win and that, they stick in my mind and and but in a positive way I love it you know, I think back and look back on some of the races and they're just like 2015 national I watched the other week on speed with tv and yes I just can't I watch it that's the one you led the I'm one you were leading thinking, for most like, of the way yeah, I'm still thinking I'm going to win this. Yeah, <laughs> and then I, and I'm still, but it's it's that it's so good. And I thought, oh my god, like I'm almost sweating watching it. But yeah, 2018 <laughs> was brilliant. Uh, won the European, should have won the British, third in the national or something. Yeah, and then yeah, I did the world final because I think that was when I didn't qualify. I can't remember, but mm. yeah. Um, all in all, you know, the last three years have been really competitive. And, you know, now it's time to start winning more. Brilliant. Before, before we move yes. on, Gary, anything else you want to ask in relation to that? No, well, I mean, going back to that, two, I think it was the 2015 National, ain't that race was it, anyone that was remotely interested in motorsport, if they watched that, they would be completely hooked on National Hot Rods. And, and I mean, that's what we probably try to replicate every week, really, because it was a real who was going to win it, the, the drama. But I, I think we do get many races in our sport that are as good as that, really. I mean, um, and I think you also touched upon how hard it is to to go out and win early doors nowadays. There is very few drivers that have hit the ground running. They have to, you have to do your time, you know. And uh, maybe recently, I, mean, I think it's probably unfair if you pull out a name, but like Perry Cook has has, has come in and been really successful. But there, I can't think of many that have first season have, have won a lot of races. No. I, I agree. I think Perry Cook, um, I'm a big fan of. And what's really um, the quality, I think, that the quality he is, I think is is exceptional because he's now a, 
a red top and has been for, you know, he's a fully qualified red top, not just someone who's been a bit lucky with the results. He's, mm -hmm. he's earned everything and he's yeah. a consistent red top and he hasn't, he hasn't annoyed anyone along the way. I was going to say <laughs> yeah. some strong words from that, but he hasn't f f fell out with anyone and I fell out with young. everyone to get to the red top. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, we could talk about your races, yeah. where you've been, what you've done for a uh, long, long time. Maybe we need to do this on another one of these podcasts, go through some of these, because I've got loads more questions to ask you. But uh, we need to bring it up to date. And uh, I can see us heading in towards the garage. So it's all change for the new season. Yeah. Why the change? Well, um, I've been looking to change for a while. And um, not there's not been really many choices of car out there and I've wanted a I really wanted a hatchback I wanted something that was was manufactured um sort of very individually uh and with uh when Terry Hum bought out the uh autocross fiesta at the national in 2019 and did I think a grand total of about four laps on the Friday okay. And he was about third quickest. <laughs> and that was the first time he'd sat in the car. Yeah. Um, and he was like, wow, you know, we know Terry's good at doing quick laps because he can do quick laps. Mm. Uh, he knows, you know, his consistency is, is, isn't quite there, but, you know, he, he's working on that. But he can do a quick lap and he turned up and this car was fast. And, and it, it was in many respects a, an extremely ugly car. <laughs> uh, but I liked it. Uh, no one's going to say it that. The Lego brick. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's the Lego brick. But uh, but they now do round arches and all this sort of thing. But it's the autocross mm. fiesta, and that that that's it there. And I'll try and get out the thing. I'll tell you what I'll do. I suppose what I no. I'll tell you. What, I'm not going to get too flash. <laughs> but you going to get yeah. Sure basically, of it? everything. Pretty much everything's new. Um, the idea was that I was going to transfer everything off the old car, but you get carried away with these things. Then you find there's a few problems. So we got the Ford Duratec again. Um, this is a new engine. The old one was pretty much scrapped because um, they're aluminium, these Ford Duratecs. And so they have a lifespan you know, less than a Vauxhall because the Vauxhall's steel. So with these going hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold all the time, the aluminium just gets fragile. So as we were one of the first to use the Ford, my old Ford uh, engine, the block was, uh, you know, quite old and also the head. So we've changed both. Um, so that's, that's uh, almost a new engine. Um, all the new exhausts are new, suspensions are new. Um, suspensions very it's double wish, double wishbone suspension on the front. Uh, you know, discs break, disc brakes as big as we can get them <laughs> because we use 13 inch wheels. Um, there's only so much you can do with these with the brakes, and they really run to their absolute maximum temperature because they're quite small brake discs because of the small wheels um so uh yeah we use i use the ap brakes on the front they're sort of four pot cali calipers um and yeah they're running to the absolute maximum we've got a big oil tank i'll try not to this isn't very professional i understand Good. but oh there you go so we've got a big oil tank there this, this is what they call a dry sump uh, so rather than having a big sump underneath with all the oil in, we have a pump. We have a very small sump and a pump on the side. It pumps the engine, uh, pumps the oil through the engine, out the other side, through a cooler, into a separate tank. This generally gives you uh, more horsepower. I'm not, not exactly sure why, to be honest, but it does. Um, and more control over oil pressure, things like that. Um, then, ooh, so then inside this one, uh, got a, just doing the electric. So we're not far away. You can see, 
um, electrics there. So just three simple gauges. We don't need a speedo. We just have the rev counter. Once we're in gear, you don't change gear around an oval. You just stick it in the same gear. So you're up and down the revs. So you need to know the revs because uh, you need to maximize and optimize the revs. And then you've got oil pressure, water, uh, oil pressure and water, uh, water temperature. Oh, there's the old man in the background, by the way. I saw that. <laughs> uh, a few others. But uh, great gallery. Then, yeah. Uh, seat. I have one of these full containment seats, it's called, made out of aluminium. Uh, some people hate them. I love them. They're so comfy. And it just holds your whole body in it. It's like a NASCAR seat. And then round the back, uh, again. So we've got a solid rear axle. Everyone has to use a solid rear axle. They're all the same. Uh, so rather than independent suspension, it's a solid beam. Tends to make them oversteer under power. So you can't get as much grip with a solid axle. Um, which is great because we all like going sideways, don't we? <laughs> um, um, oh, you got your thumb over the microphone, I think, Shane. Oh, uh, probably. Uh, so yeah, oh, we, we didn't hear I that. Think... Can you say that last bit again? You were just showing. Uh, I was just showing the exhaust, actually. Right. Okay. Simpson exhaust, very very good. I think I'm going to get the front part of it. Um, I want to get that ceramic coated, ideally. Uh, that who's bit, doing just keep everything cooler. Is 2B, is 2B your engine still, Shane, is it? Or uh, who's doing your engine? Yeah, yeah 2V's the engine. Um, he's been doing our engines, I say ours. He was my dad's engine builder. And um, and I've stuck, yeah, stuck, I had an Anderson for a little while because that's what the original car I bought had in it. Uh, then John, um, uh, you know, I was chatted to him a lot anyway, and we just, well, he he was saying, you know, you need to get a Ford Duratec. That's the way forward. And, uh, and I said, well, if that's what you think, let's do it. And yeah, and then so we were, it was only Mikey Godfrey that had one at that time. Mm. So we put one in and, and uh, you know, within, I guess, about a year, I think we won that European. So, and now I think they're, the more common engine so it's nice to be one of the first with that and and with the fiesta as well i think the order book's pretty full now uh, yeah. not not down to me but you know it's it makes me feel confident that i'll go in the right direction when so, you uh, set it up from now are you setting it up with what you did with the tigra with them them sort of geometry or do you have you got an idea what the setup's going to be no, I'm, I'm going to let uh, Simon at Autocross do that. Uh, he, so I've got all my old data, obviously, but yeah, this is, I'm going down a completely new path. So everything's different on this. The, the way the rear axle is within the car on this is what they call a Watts linkage, whereas the old car was a Panard rod, which makes a difference. Um, this is the, the spring rates are totally different on this car than the old car. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a completely new setup. Um, and I'm, you know, let, I'm hopeful that, I mean, it's a beautiful car. Simon has, has the, the detail, the attention detail. It's just been a total pleasure to deal with him. Mm -hmm. And I've really enjoyed the process and, I suppose I should send. So he did a lot of the work, but my list looks like that. So <laughs> there's 34 items on my list to do, and I've I've been smashing through them again because it's a new car and it's built with such detail. It's really easy to put together thereafter. You know, everything's in the right place. Everything's mounted properly. Um. I love it. Yeah, I, I'm just so hopeful it, it goes as well as it looks because I think it's gonna it's gonna be like showroom condition. And I might that might mean I never race in the wet again. <laughs> <laughs> so, a couple of last questions before we wind up. Clearly, you think it's a Tigra Vita. Yeah, I, I um, 
I hope so. And I do. Yeah, I do. I think the Tigra now has run its course. Uh, mm. It's still a competitive car. Um, and I think it's still won all the champ- most of the championships. But the Tigra, as we knew it, is, you know, the Rob McDonald car is it's not a Tigra that you buy off the shelf, mm. uh, nor is any other quick Tigra. They're not really off the shelf Tigras. They're very different. Whereas, an, whereas this car is an off-the-shelf autocross car. And I think that's where, you know, the next generation of cars will be, is off-the-shelf. They will be as fast as a really fast Tigra. And and I think that that's where I'm hoping I'm going to be with this, is that, you know, I'll be, I'll be able to kind of uh, jump up a little bit. And when are you hoping to have it out on track? Um, well, it'll be ready in two weeks. Uh, it's going to go back to Simon next week for the body shell to be put on, which is at the spray shop. He wanted to put the body shell on, uh, and I'm certainly uh, happy to let him put the body shell on because I hate that job. So he's going to put the body shell on. He's going to do a setup on it. Uh, so that, yeah, two weeks it'll be ready, and then it'll be a case of finding a track that, that allows us to go practice or whatever i don't really know the rules and regs on that at the moment so um without wishing to put a downer on it um you're currently 11th in the points do you feel that there's a risk that if you bring it out this side of the world final um developing a new car something that's completely fresh to you there's a risk that you would not make it onto the grid for the world final and does that bother you particularly if that is the case or do you think it's going to be Um, quick out of the box well, uh, yeah, who knows? Um, I'm happy to take the risk because um, I, I, I felt like I did everything I could with the Tigra. And OK, last year I did find a, a ton of pace at Ipswich at the World Final, which I did some fundamental different things and it did go a lot quicker. But um, the, my enjoyment of working on cars... And, you know, there's so much commitment to them that, you know, and really to have the passion for the car as well as just driving it. And it's the project, really. And I feel like I've been trying to get away from the Tigra for a few, fair few years now. Mm. Whereas I look at this and I go, OK, that's a five year car minimum. Yeah. So I would really like to have that chassis and that car for the next five years and carry on racing for another five years. And see where and, and see where we are after that. And that's kind of, so. This is kind of the beginning of a a new project. And if I qualify for the world final this year, brilliant. If I don't, well, you know, so mm. be it. And then, of course, in five years' time, Bland Junior Junior will be knocking on the door, going, "Dad, uh, can I have a race car, please?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that, maybe not. Oh. <laughs> the horror of it. Gary, uh, anything we, else you want to add to that? To, yeah, the, the arches. So the, this is the this is the marmite of the car. Have you decided what arches you're going to go? Or are you going to leave that as a surprise? Well, I can't. I genuinely can't remember, and I mean that because <laughs> I've changed my mind so many times that I can't remember what the last view was before I told Simon to get them painted. So whatever's in the paint shop is going on the car. And I I kind of keep meaning to ask Simon, <laughs> go, what, what body Brilliant. paint? And I, th- I think, well, I don't want to ask him because then he so, like, tries to help with everything. He'll be like, well, if you want to change them, you can. And be like, no, don't, don't say I can change them because I'll end up with, you know, all that. So, yeah, I keep changing my mind. Whatever's <laughs> in the spray shop's in there. And I can't remember if it's square or round or a mixture. Good. Brilliant. Good brilliant um i can't believe how long we've been talking for so we uh, probably need to uh, wind this up i hope you're yeah. going to be uh, posting some pictures somewhere when the uh, body shell comes back and we can see the finished article we're all very very curious to see it and even more excited to see how well it goes and how you get on with it yeah well i've got a new slightly new branding it's still going to be black and white <laughs> and plain as possible but i have got some a little bit of new branding on there so it um i think it's going to look brilliant 
So I think we need yeah. to keep our eyes on nationalhotrod.com because I'm guessing that's probably where the pictures are going to appear first, is it? Yeah, absolutely. I think we all of us can't wait to get back racing. So hopefully yeah. the fans will be let in, or if not, it might be live on Speedbook Telly or whatever the plan is. But uh, can't wait to get back out there racing. So uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you, Shane and uh, Brian as well. Hopefully we'll be both there watching and. Uh, yeah, with lots of lots of people as well. Hopefully, all this work that everyone's been doing over the winter and or however long this winter's been going on, that people are enthusiastic to go back and support National Hot Rod Racing. I think so. I think the vibe is really good at the moment, and uh, hopefully, people have enjoyed this podcast. I mean, we have. People have really yeah, bored out the brains by now, but we've had a good time. So Love sorry it. if you've had to listen, but thank you for having to listen. And uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I can't wait to get out there. So, as far as yeah. I'm concerned, it's been uh, the highlight of the week so far. It's been a, a very uh, fascinating hour. It's been really good to find out some stuff about your history and uh, how you've got to where you're at. Great to see the car. So, thank you for giving us uh, a look at that. And uh, definitely looking forward to seeing you out on track. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to wind it up now. Uh, so, thank you to everybody for joining us and uh, thank you for making it to the end of this podcast. We're going to be back again very, very soon with somebody else. We hope you will join us then. So from uh, Shane, Gary and myself, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.